The Kaya Girl, a novel by Mamle Wolu. Chapter 1 Hi, I said. There was no reply. At the say, I tried in chi. Still, she was quiet. She looked frustrated with herself for not being able to reply. She gave a shy smile to show she did not intend to be rude and lowered her large metal bowl. I smiled back and suddenly language did not seem important. It was as if we knew each other already. Abna, stop wasting time and bring her inside. My aunt called from inside the shop. She is here to carry things, not to chat with you. Hey, small girl, brah. She finished off briskly, ordering the girl inside with a curl of her fingers. The girl hurried in carrying her oversized metal bowl before her and placed it at Aunt Lydia's feet. As she bent down, I could see that her eye was caught by the gleaming French manicure on Auntie's long, pointy toenails. With eyes still lowered, she collected the six Belgian shopping bags from the fat customer with the eight rings on her fingers and arranged them deftly inside her bowl. This was the awkward moment because she needed help but did not know how to ask for it. I rushed over and grabbed the rim of the bowl to help lift it onto her head. We struggled a bit as it tipped precariously in my direction. Then it was up, sitting snugly on the flattened pad on her head. A faded scarf rolled into a cloth snail shell. As we did this, a new customer entered the shop, immaculate in a white lace and nago wrapper and top, with a red and gold ghillie on her head. It was so gorgeously folded and tied that I resolved there and then to go to the shop next door and beg the Nigerian lady to teach me how to do it. Auntie was mesmerized too, so I took advantage and slipped out following the girl with a huge bowl on her head. I could not believe how straight and fast she walked with that weight on her head. I imagined that if we had put it on my head instead, my whole neck would have been pushed down into my chest and my knees would have collapsed into my feet. We walked in single file. Auntie's customer, who had now become the girl's, leading the way towards her car, the girl following and me, unseen, bringing up the rear. I did not really know why I was following. I didn't think about that till later, a few hours later and then, many years later. A few hours later, I thought I had probably done it because I was getting bored spending all day every day at auntie's shop. Mommy had traveled to London to have a baby and daddy was busy with work and Aunt Lydia had offered to have me for the long vacation. I liked Aunt Lydia but I was a bit scared of her and it would have been rude to say no. But also, I was looking forward to spending time at her shop in Makola Market. Mommy hardly ever went to the market. She said it exhausted her, so she sent our house help every week instead. I had only been to Makola the few times she wanted to visit Aunt Lydia there. I found it fascinating. All the hustle and bustle, the smells and the colors. One minute, you'd be admiring sequined lace fabric, and the next, you'd almost stumble over a tray of coiling, written black snails. You would see granite paste in huge bowls, enough to dive into, and substances you never knew existed, rolled into balls, cut into blocks, twisted into shapes that you wondered what on earth you were meant to do with. Eat them, take a bath with them, build a house with them. 
Auntie Lydia's shop was one of the fanciest in Makla Market, with air conditioning and brocade curtains. Oh yes, she was a proper market queen, my auntie. But the one thing that disappointed me about her shop was that she did not have a cash tail. I had always longed to press the buttons on those machines, like the uniform shop assistants sitting in rows in the supermarkets, tapping their fingers so fast and so expertly over the keys. No, Auntie just collected all the money, rather untidily, I thought, in the lower drawer of her desk. But it was still exciting to see all the pretty things in the shop and to be given the responsibility for serving customers. It made me feel quite grown up. Although I noticed the girls with the large metal balls on their heads walking around in my first few days, I did not really pay them much attention until one came into my shop. That was when a customer made a large purchase. Abna, go outside and call us a kayayu, auntie said. A kaya what? I asked. Aunt Lydia smiled. Hmm. <laughs> your parents are making a brownie out of you at that your American school, she said, glancing with a mixture of pride and embarrassment at her customer. Go and call me one of those girls carrying big bowls on their heads, she said, switching to Chi in that deliberate manner she used whenever she was on a mission to rescue the Ghanaian in me. I stepped outside blinking in the blazing sunshine and screwed up my eyes trying to spot one. It did not take long because she signaled pertly when she saw me scanning the stalls and alleys. I nodded and she marched briskly to the shop. I noticed them more after that but I never had the urge to talk to them until today. This one was different. She looked no older than me and it was the shy, slightly scared look in her eyes that made me notice her. And when I realized she didn't speak any language I knew, I was amazed and intrigued. How could she be working in Makola Market when she did not speak Chi or Ga or English? What did she speak? I wondered as I trailed her and her customer. Perhaps I would find out when we reached car park. But I did not. She just lowered her bowl and packed the goose into the madame's car boots for her. Then she accepted the coins with a tiny nod and put the empty bowl back on her head. The cars packed with a rich pearl as she turned around. She saw me immediately and I knew she was not surprised, although she had had no idea I was following her. She smiled the same smile. It was the second time, and I noticed the same thing, that when she smiled at me, the lost look in her eyes disappeared. Perhaps that was what had made me follow her. I knew that Auntie would be wondering where I was, and judging from the girl's grip on her bowl, she knew she would be looking for her next customer. But she just walked over to me as if we had an appointment. We looked at each other, and I noticed that she had a fine line etched vertically in the middle of each cheek. I'm Abna, I said in Chi. I'm Pfizer, she said in a language. I would soon find out was called Dangbanli. We did not speak each other's languages, but I heard her name, and she heard mine. And I found out other things about her too that day. Don't ask me how. But somehow, she was just so easy to talk to. I guess we must have used some sign language and a few universal words that even she could understand. I don't know how to explain it, but I found her easier to talk to than people with whom I could converse in two or three languages. She came from a place called Tonlong in the northern region, and she had just arrived in Accra the day before. And she was 14 years old, like me. End of chapter 1. Listen to chapter 2 in the next video. Thanks for watching.
Please like our videos, subscribe, hit the bell for more exciting videos. Thank you.